as usual. Does anybody have any questions about anything? I have a writing assignment due tomorrow. Everybody knows that, hopefully. All right. Um, we're going to continue our discussion this week about human resources. Um, so we're going to be covering chapters 8, 9, and 10 this week. And um, we're going to start with talking about recruitment. Has anybody ever participated in recruitment anywhere, working anywhere? Any jobs or? Um, you said you have? Stressful? Yes. Why? Reading the applications and actually the ones that actually call in our route to check on the applications, you have to make sure you go back and pull the application to see exactly what's on there. And they're the type of person you want to have in your company. It's, it's really, it's, it it's a lot stressful. of work. Um, but it's something that's very important because it's kind of the, the front line. If you don't screen them um, when you're recruiting and you decide to hire them and then you bring them in and you decide it's not a good fit, you know, everybody suffers. The company suffers, your department suffers. So recruitment is very important. Um, and as we were just talking about, here are some of the things that can happen if you make a bad choice. Obviously cost, you lose money. Um, having to go back and repeat the advertising you've already done, whether that be putting it in the newspaper again or running it on the radio. Um, you're losing time while that position is vacant. Um, obviously, something's not being done if that position is vacant or somebody's being overworked. Um, cost of overtime, you may be paying someone unemployment, whoever left the job. So there's a lot of different costs um, that can happen as a result of making a poor choice when it comes to recruitment. I wanted to ask a question. Yeah. They had a certain amount of, um, I guess you call aids or people they wanted to have. Uh -huh. So that added to the pressure of it too, right? You know. So I understand all this stuff is said, but when they put that to it, you certain certain things you may overlook because you're trying to get those numbers. The hits. Right. Try. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's a hard place to be in because sometimes you are in somewhat of a time crunch, and you just have to find somebody. Yeah. Um, so it's you know <laughs> cost and effect. Definitely good point. Um, what are some things that you need to to recruit good employees? Well, you need a good selection process, something that's fair, um, that's you know not biased to anybody, something that's going to allow you to select the best candidate. Um, you want to be able to have something to offer the candidate. So you want to have the ability to persuade um, those best candidates that your organization is the one that they should work for. So what's a desirable candidate? Well, I'm just going to ask you guys here. What's your definition of a desirable candidate? Someone who is qualified for the job for number one. And All right, stop right there. Qualified. We'll come back. Mm -hmm. um, hard worker. Hard worker. Oh, <laughs> 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 yeah, I was going to say hard worker. Dedicated, I guess. Dedicated. <laughs> it's a desirable candidate. Who would you want to hire? Someone who knows how to do the job and a person who's responsible. Okay, somebody who knows how to do the job. Um, personality, people person. Personality, people person. All great, great points. Um, and, and you guys mentioned all of these on the board. Somebody that needs to have the, the technical skills, effective communicators, which I think will fall under having good people skills, being able to deal with people, flexible. I don't think anybody mentioned that. But having somebody that's flexible, obviously, would also be somebody that's desirable. So when we're, we're recruiting people, there's obviously some things we can't ask them about. Um, a lot of it deals with familial status, so you can't ask about their spouse or what their spouse does or if they're married. Um, obviously, you can't ask their age. Um, you can't ask them about if they're planning a family or pregnancy or anything like that. Um, and these are all things that um, the law says that you cannot ask. So for whatever reason, if you ask these things, you're violating the law. Um, here's some more things. You can't ask about their religious affiliation. So you can't say, you know, are you Protestant or Baptist? 
None of that stuff you can ask. You can't ask them about it. any disabilities, um, if they're in a union. So there's a lot of things you have to be careful about asking while you're uh, recruiting. Um, and so we come to the work workforce that we are in right now. And even if you go into a, a workplace or an establishment, you'll see that there's more people that are um, older than you might typically see, you know, maybe five to 10 years ago. And it's because of the baby boomer population and the fact that a lot of people are working a lot longer than they used to. Um, and so what this says is that there's a large population of people that are 50 or older that are still working. Now, uh, in the past, mandatory requirement, you know, was something that, I mean, mandatory retirement is something that was in the past, but now that has been eliminated. So they can practically work however, however long they want to until, for whatever reason, they can't work anymore. So this is something that you have to uh, keep in mind when you're recruiting also is that you may have a lot of applicants that are, you know, older than what you may have seen in the past, and you have to account for that. Um, now, we talked about um, a sense of urgency and having to feel something quickly and how that might affect our recruitment, but these are some ways to help that issue, um, is using interns to fill in until you find someone. Um, you can do uh, sign-on bonuses or help pay any moving expenses that they may have. Um, some companies do this where they pay their employees finder's fees, um, which is kind of like an incentive for them to kind of talk to the people they know to see if they may know somebody that may be looking for a job. And then in turn, the employer will just compensate the employee a fee. So resumes, as you talked about, recruiting, having to go through a lot of different resumes and, and we do the resumes to see which ones are good and have a good pile and a bad pile. Um, and a maybe. A maybe pile. <laughs> but what we have to uh, be careful of is the fact that a lot of people tend to copy, copy <laughs> or over-exaggerate a tad on their resume sometimes. Um, or maybe not a tad, but a lot of times people tend to over-exaggerate on their resume or they may even put things that are just outright not true at all. And you have to keep this in mind when you're reviewing resumes. You may, you may find this outstanding resume that just looks perfect. And while we don't want to discredit anyone or think that anyone's not telling the truth, in the back of your mind you need to realize that there's a possibility that they may have over-exaggerated some things. Um, and so you just have to really review the resumes with a fine tooth comb to uh, check for exaggerations or also not just exaggerations, but um, if there's any significant time gaps, that's something you definitely want to inquire about if you decide to bring that person in for, a for an interview. Um, job changes, they're changing jobs like every two months or something like that. That's, some, that's something you want to to uh, flag as well. Um, typically on resumes, people will put if they're certified or licensed in XYZ. Well, you need to verify it. Uh, that may require calling a local agency or a state agency, or at this point, there's some places online where you can check this stuff. Um, you can go to the license place, the North Carolina license board right. online, yeah. and put in a social security number, you can pull up all the licenses at one time. Right. And then also, I've personally found where people have um, put down that they attended a certain college and they didn't go there at all, um, or they graduated with a certain degree and they didn't graduate with that degree at all. So you also want to verify college attendance as well, and that's an easy phone call um, as long as you have yeah. It's like the CEO from Yahoo, remember that? Yep. You read about him. Exactly. He got fired because he got something on his person like that was, or he put something that it was, I don't know. It was about school. The school. Yeah. 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 He, was, he had joined a college and he wasn't actually at that college. And I think he had said he got an MBA yeah. or something yeah. like that yeah. and it turned out he didn't have an MBA or, yeah, but it was, it was definitely school related. Yeah. So this can definitely be something very serious if, um, 
if you find out. And I'm sure, you know, while he got punished, I'm sure whoever was supposed to check on that yeah, right. probably got fired too. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you are verifying all of this information um, as well. So now we get to the interview. We've, you know, reviewed all these resumes. We decided we want to interview, and we got to bring them in. So who should interview? Who should do the interviewing? Supervisors. Supervisor. Uh, managers. Managers. And whoever is in charge. Whoever's in charge. Right. Um, typically, you want to have the person that 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 person would directly report to do the interviewing or at least be involved in the interviewing. You know, I've had some times where, you know, I've been on interviews and the supervisor may only be there for a, a certain period of time because they have other things to do, but they should at some point be involved in the interviewing process. Um, as well as, it may be more than one person doing the interview. It may be the supervisor and the manager or two supervisors if they're gonna be working with more than one. But definitely somebody who's gonna be in charge, who they're gonna be reporting to, who they'll be working for. Um, now what do we have to do before, let's say uh, it's a week before the interview, as a supervisor or manager, how do we have to prepare? Make sure you pull that resume and the application before the person gets there. Yep. The job list that you want, that they're going to be doing. So you know. Job description. Job description. Job description. What about questions? Yeah. You got to have some questions, right? Questions, yeah. So you should already have your questions before the day of the interview, as well as the other things you said, the, the resume. Uh, the application, the job description. Um, you may also want to go ahead and schedule where you're going to have the interview at, uh, like what office or what location. If you are planning to give this person a tour, you may also want to plan that out. A lot of times after the interview, they may take the person around to tour or meet other people. So you also want to alert other managers or whoever, you know, send out an email, you know, I plan to e uh, interview three candidates tomorrow will you be available just for us to come by and tour and do a short introduction. So you also want to let other people in the organization know what's going on um, to prepare for the interview. A lot of people now are waiting until they do the orientation to do um, walkthroughs. Yeah. Because of the simple fact, if they don't hire that person, they don't want them to know the layout of their company. So a lot of people are starting to wait till they do orientation. That way they do one big walkthrough and those are the people they're going to hire. And that, they put them where they mm -hmm. I can understand that 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 side um, however what benefits do you think could come from doing a tour or taking that person around during the interview maybe fill them out fill them out you can see how they interact with other people mm -hmm. um, like I said you will be introducing them to other people managers in the, in the organization mm -hmm. so they may also have input they may see something right. that you haven't seen um, as they interact with that person. So I actually think it's a, it's a good idea to, to take them around, even during the interview, just to see how they interact. Because a person may interact totally different in a closed room on a one-on-one -on -one basis versus in a, you know, a more open situation with more than one person. So, um, you know, I see both sides. I feel like if somebody wants to learn a layout, they can learn it. Regardless, regardless mm -hmm. they can come in as a visitor and learn the layout if they want to. Um, so I kind of like the idea of, of uh, touring them around, but I, I, I do get both sides. Um, now the day of the interview, you obviously want to be on time. The worst thing is to be the person interviewing someone and you're late. Now, I think that a lot of times the interviewers would do this to psych a person out, keep them waiting, um, it happens all the time. But for me, um, just like I have to come to impress the employer, to a certain degree, the employer needs to be impressing the candidate if it's somebody they really want to bring into their organization. So being on time to me shows that we're serious about you, we respect your time as much as you respect our time, and we're about business. Um, you know, this is how we run our organization, we do things on time. So I think it's important to be on time. Um, you always want to uh, make sure that the person is comfortable. We're all going to be nervous if we come in to interview. So do whatever you can to try to put them at ease and make them more comfortable. <coughs> um, and typically in the interview, you want to go through a chronological order of their work experience. The type of questions you'll hear is, you know, review with us your work 
experience, start from, you know, whatever year and bring us up to speed to where you are now. Um, and that kind of gives the applicant the opportunity to kind of speak to their <laughs> skills and their experiences and what they've done. And you can just listen. Um, and then, obviously, you want to market the position. After you've given them the chance to talk, you want to talk about your organization, department, why it would be a good thing for them to work there, why you want them to come in and work here, and the benefits and all that kind of stuff. So in a sense, it's, it's a mutual thing. As an interviewee, you're marketing yourself. As an inter interviewer, you're marketing your company to the person, the applicant. So what kind of questions do you ask? You obviously want to ask open-ended questions. That means you don't want to ask questions that can be answered with a yes or a no. And they might know why. Because anybody can give you a yes or no. I can tell you yes all day long and not know how to do nothing. Right. Exactly. You want to make sure that the person can speak, you know, very well to their skills and their experiences. And if you just ask yes or no questions, by the end of the interview, you haven't learned anything about them besides the fact that they can say yes or no. Um, and they say that, you know, using the why, what, who, when, and where are, are good ways to try to probe people to give you more information outside of just giving you a yes or a no. So, you know, as we talked about, you can't ask any questions about their age, their race, their uh, disability, familial status. These types of questions you definitely want to stay away from. Um, as, as we said, it kind of violates the laws. Um, now, while you're asking open-ended questions, you want to try to ask questions that give you an idea about the person's um, teamwork ability. Can they work well in teams? There may be some positions where they don't need to work well in teams, but regardless, you need to know one way or the other what type of employee they, they will be. Um, you you want to know how they deal with stress. Especially in healthcare, there'll be a lot of deadlines and last minute things come up. So you want to be sure that they can handle stress. Um, how motivated are they? Those type of questions. Customer service, healthcare is all about customer service. So you want to make sure that um, they have the mentality to be able to, to serve our patients and serve the customers. How can we tell if they're lying? No eye contact. No eye contact, body language, right? Mm -hmm. um, if they're looking down or fidgety, um, those are, are you know, definitely red flags in the other way. As we talked about resumes, the resume is just perfect, no flaws or anything. That could be a red flag. Anything else? Talk about body language, resumes. I just can't explain their past. Like if you ask them something off, uh, you have their resume, you ask them, uh, what college did you go to? That should be an easy answer, and right? That should be an right. easy, you know, what degree did you get in college? You know, if they can't tell you exactly what they put on their resume, then you know that their resume ain't even theirs. <laughs> right. And, and the resume, that's your baby. So you should be able to speak to your resume up and down, left and right. You shouldn't even need it anywhere near you. Um, that's something you've created, hopefully, and you've edited and you've revised it over and over. So that should definitely be something that you know in your sleep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if they're stumbling over anything about school or their work experiences, and that's, uh, it says, you know, talks about wording, um, that could be another red flag. Something may not be right about that. Um, it may be that it's not true, or maybe they, you know, exaggerated a little bit, or maybe it's not even their resume. Maybe they took somebody else's resume and just put their name on it. You never know. Um, but those are, are good ways to, to, you know, detect if somebody's not telling the truth or not. Um, now, a good candidate will always come with questions. You should never go to an interview and not have any questions. Um, I tell people to at least always have at least three questions that you want to ask them because a good interviewer is always at the end going to say, do you have any yeah. questions? Mm -hmm. um, and you don't want to say no and just get up and leave because that may show that you're not really interested. You just want a job. You know, you're not really interested in that organization or the position. So a lot of times interviewers will look at the questions that you ask to determine how good of a candidate you are. They can also tell if you just made up some questions just to have a question too. So you want to take some time, just as much time as you spend 
practicing, reviewing your resume to make sure that you're speaking well. You also want to review those questions that you're going to ask the employer as well because the questions you ask are going to be a good indicator of what type of candidate you are. So if you ask the questions like, what time will my lunch break be again? <laughs> what, what does that mean? What, what does that tell us? <laughs> You didn't even get your first orientation, you asked me what time lunch. <laughs> what, what is that? What is that? What kind of a signal does that give off? That you're really not going to work. You're, you're not going to work. You're, you're going to be waiting for lunch. <laughs> you're thinking about break already. You haven't even worked an hour, right? <laughs> the kind of question you want to, uh, you know, look at candidates that ask questions like, what type of projects will I be working on? You know, those types of questions um, will tell you the difference between a good candidate and somebody you might want to pass on. The one question I've noticed that stumped up managers is if you ask them, how is their teamwork? I've done that to a lot of companies and the manager will sit there and look at me like, what? <laughs> like, where did that come from? You know, how is your teamwork here? You know, why would I want to work somewhere where they have no teamwork? Right. So how is your teamwork? If you're a manager, you should know how your teamwork is. Right. So I've seen that stump a lot of managers. Um, so we've interviewed our candidates. We, we interviewed three, and now we have to try to weigh each one to see who we're going to pick. So, it says weigh negatives more heavily than positives. Why? Why do you think that's the case? You don't want a negative person. Do you? I mean, if they can't answer what's on their resume, if they can't answer simple questions, why would you want them to work there? Even though they might be a hard worker or they might have this degree, I wouldn't want you to work there if you have no teamwork, if you're not able to be relied on. I wouldn't want you to work there. That would outweigh your degree. All right. There, there are some negatives that may, down the road, cause you or your team or the organization, you know, a lot of grief more so than one positive that they may have. So you definitely want to heavily consider the negatives. While you may not want to cancel out the positives, but you want to weigh those negatives more than the positives, because if trouble comes, that positive is not going to get you out of trouble. Um, so you, you want to consider those. Um, you want to look at flexibility, look at how flexible each candidate is. You may have one candidate that says, well, I can't work any weekends. You may have another candidate that says, you know, I'm willing to come in whenever, I, whenever you need me to. So you want to look at um, flexibility, um, feelings and beliefs. You will have some candidates that when they walk in, you just know that they're very set in their ways and set in their beliefs. And that may not necessarily be the best candidate for your environment. If it's an environment where you have a lot of teamwork, working in teams, and this candidate seems like they're very set in their ways, that may be a red flag that they may not be a good team player. So you want to watch for those type of candidates. And while they may be great in certain environments, if your environment is different from that or one where there's going to be a lot of teamwork needed, that's something that you have to watch out for. Um, and that kind of leads into trying to see if that person is customer oriented or task oriented. You may have some positions like an uh, analyst or something like that where you need somebody that has great attention to detail. And that may be a great position for somebody that's task oriented. But if you have a position like uh, some, someone that's going to be greeting patients and working with patients a lot, that's somebody that needs to be more customer oriented. So you have to kind of weigh each candidate and see where they fall in and then think back to your team and your organization and where they might fit in. Now, at the end of the uh, interview, you want to make sure that you indicate that moving forward, everything will be handled through human resources. Why is that? They're the ones that do the payroll. They set up all your information. You have to get in touch with human resources. Right. Why else? They do the background checks too. They do background checks. Why else? You don't want them contacting you. You're busy, right? You're a manager. You're a supervisor. You don't have time to answer calls about if you got the job or not. So you want to make sure that you indicate, you may have to do this more than once. Please contact Human Resources if you have any questions. You also don't want to offer the job at the interview, even if they seem great. Why is that? You may have something better come along after that. You may have something better come along after that. And again, 
you still haven't done your everything. You gotta wait on human resources to do the background check. You might offer this person a job and they may have just, you know, came out of rehab or something and you just never know. Or you may find out that everything that they said on their resume isn't true. So you don't wanna offer that person the job before you know, all the research has been done on the candidate to make sure they're legit. Um, as I said, job offers are, are always or should always be extended by human resources. Um, and typically, they'll be conditional. So they'll say, we're offering you the job upon you know, us doing the check to make sure everything's legit. But again, managers don't offer the job. That's human resources job. All right, so orientation. We've recruited, we've interviewed, and we picked somebody. Found a great candidate. Now, the next task is we have to train them and orient them to our organization. And orientation is the best opportunity to orient the, the new employee to start them off on the right track, to build a solid foundation. They don't know anything, they don't have any biases about the organization. So this is the best time to ingrain the things like the organization, mission, vision, and values in their mind right now so they start off on the right foot. So what should the orientation have? Obviously, it should be something that puts the organization in a positive light. Uh, you want to give them a good impression of the organization and of your team and your department. You want to make sure that they understand what their duties are, what their responsibilities are, first week or first you know, two weeks. You wanna make sure everything like that is clear. Um, and you also wanna make sure they know about the benefits and their pay scale and, and you don't want them to go weeks without knowing when they're gonna get paid or how often they're gonna get paid or what their benefits are. You wanna introduce them to all that stuff during orientation. Um, now obviously you also want them to know the rules, policies, um, and all of that stuff as well. Uh, you wanna um, show them how your teams work. You know, introduce them to, you know, if you have a team meeting every Monday, make sure you let them know that. Let them know why you meet every Monday and kind of what goes on. Um, just so that everybody's on the same page. You wanna make sure that they're being introduced to everybody. Um, I've seen some situations where people go through orientation and they don't meet the people they work with until after that level orientation. Go ahead and introduce them during orientation so that everybody knows who they are. Um, they can feel like um, they're a part of the team and they're not being isolated. Um, so that helps. I think it's a good idea to um, provide a little notebook or workbook. I've had, um, I worked some places where they gave like an orientation packet. They had everything you need to know in there from the rules, the policies, the benefits. And I found that to be really helpful um, for new employees. That way you have a reference if you have a question about something because you have so much information thrown to you, your orientation. So that if you have a reference to go back to when you get home and you wanna know, you know what your benefits are, you can use that, that reference book to, to figure that out. So I think that's a good idea to use something like that. Um, so what are some things that a new employee might wanna know? When you, when you start a job, what are some things you want to know? Expectations. Yeah. Expectations. What else? Promotion within the company. Promotion. That's important. Yeah. You know what to work towards. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Like Basic stuff too. Mm -hmm. Where's the cafeteria? Where do I park? That's important. You don't want to park in the CEO spot. You know, sometimes there's unwritten rules that other people may know, but you may not know. Um, you know, certain people may have certain parking spots and you wanna make sure you don't park in anybody's spots. So, you know, even basic things like that. How do I answer the telephone? How do I put people on hold? Um, or all, how do I transfer a call? How do I transfer a call? All basic things that you wanna make sure that the new employee or knows. Um, now, obviously, you also want to make sure they know about break times, how long breaks are going to be, um, what types of tasks they're going to have assigned to them initially, um, who they may be working with on these tasks, who do they report to, 
Um, now, while you may have went over these things in the interview, you want to make sure you re, um, reiterate them during the orientation process, just to make sure that they feel comfortable. Um, something I've seen people do is they'll send out an introductory email to everybody in the company and say, we've hired a new employee, you know, Jane Doe, please welcome her if you see her in the hallways. I think that's a good thing to help with orientation and to help that person feel welcome. So that when people do see them in the hallways, they'll say, oh, hey, Jane, you know, they know their name. And so that kind of helps them. Um, so that's something good to do. You want to make sure that your schedule is catered to the point where you haven't forgotten about this new person. You want to make sure that you have available time to spend with them. You don't want to just hire them and then say, you know, good luck. And just, you know, I'm in meetings all day. Um, so you want to uh, make sure that you craft your schedule so that you're available and you have a lot of time to spend an hour or two hours with them every day for the first week or first two weeks to help them get oriented. And it's always good to have an agenda um, for during that orientation period for that person to see what they're going to be doing so they know what to expect. Uh, we already talked about orientation packet. All right, during orientation, it's also important that we talk about evaluation. You need to explain to them early on how often they'll be evaluated, um, what they'll be evaluated on, so that they know, again, like you said, they know what goals to reach or what to work towards. If they know they're going to be evaluated on you know, a specific service, then they'll know that that's a service they have to be good at because they're going to be watched and they're going to be evaluated on that and that may determine if they get raised or not. So you want to make it clear um, about their performance and how it'll be evaluated. You want to make sure that they're aware of whatever department or team goals that your team or department may have so they can help the team work towards those. And then um, again, with healthcare being customer service related, you want to make sure that they're, um, they come up to speed on whatever customer service um, initiatives you guys may have in your department. Colleagues, we talked about this a little bit. It's very important to introduce the new people or new person to your staff. Um, and why do you think that Introductions are so important. It lets them know he, the, the extra staff here, other employees. Let, that lets them know that maybe this person might need help, or you know, keep an eye out. Maybe they may, you know, they're kind of new, so make sure they get to where they need to get to. Because sometimes buildings are big and they don't know where they're going, or right. they don't know their way around. So if you go and ask somebody and they don't know you're new, they're like. You know it's down there, you know, and keep it moving, you know, but this would let them know that this person is new, so just keep an eye out and see if they need any help through that week, that first week of orientation or the next week or as time goes on. Right. Um, and also, perception is everything. So if this is your new employee and you haven't taken the time to take them around and introduce them, what might that give off to other employees? might give off to other employees that they're not that important. They're not relevant enough to be even be introduced to me. Okay, fine, I don't need to worry about them. I don't need to reach out to them because they haven't been introduced. So um, it's very important to, to make sure that even if it's not somebody that they have to report to, even if it's just another coworker, you want to make sure that they're being introduced so that people know and they're aware and that they do realize that this is a new, you know, important person to our team. They're important. We need to involve them in things. We need to ask them if they want to go to lunch with us, those types of things. Um, so you want to make sure they feel involved. Now, we've gone through orientation. Now we get to training. Everybody realize those are two different things, right? All right, so we're training the employee. What are some things you want to tell them on day one of training? Where to find stuff. Where to find stuff, supplies, all that kind of stuff. Your, your key people, like. Key people. Like, you know, who your supervisor is, who the big boss is, because you don't want to be, you know, and be like, oh, that was the big boss. You're like, oh, you know. <laughs> Correct. And not, not just 
you know, the big boss, the key, key people in general. You know, um, if you have uh, uh, someone come in and, and they speak Spanish, Jennifer is the one to go to. You know, she may not be a boss, but she still might be a key person. Um, you know, if you have someone that has insurance issues, you know, maybe Ms. Dobbins is the one that you want to talk to. So you want to make sure not only, you know, like you said, the bosses and the managers, but just different key people in the um, department as well. There may be somebody that's been there for 30 years. They know where everything is. They know everybody. That's a key person, right? So you want to make sure that, um, that they're aware of certain people and their skills and talents. What else might you want to tell them? First day of training. Duties. What they have to do. What they have to do. Duties. All right. Anything else? Deadlines. If they have a, a certain task or or that duty that they have to do once a week every Monday, that's the kind of thing you want to tell them. All right. Every Monday you have to check the supplies. It has to be done by noon. If you don't get it done by noon, this is what will happen. Those types of things, expectations, um, deadlines, um, attitudes. You want to go ahead and establish that. You know, well, you know, this is first day of training. Well, let me go ahead and tell you, this is a very team-oriented environment. We all work together. Everybody has a good attitude, so you have to have a good attitude to work with us. You know, we don't deal with people who are, you know, they outcast themselves or work alone. So you want to go ahead and set those expectations with regards to personalities and behaviors as well. I've always made mistakes too. They always tell you that, but how can you do that? I'm sorry? They always tell you like to avoid making mistakes. Like Making mistakes? Yes. Who said that? Well, not really, but if you do, because that can affect, you know, and then some other people have to come and fix it. But if you have the time to go ahead and fix whatever you did, you know, just go ahead, not, don't let it go because I don't know, they just always say stuff like that. Let's talk about that a little bit though. You know, we're in training. Do we really That's a lot of pressure. It is a lot of pressure. Do we really wanna to set that type of expectation to our new employee that they can't make no. any mistakes? No. They just scare you. It happens. <laughs> don't get me wrong, it happens. There's some places that you will get hired where they will be like, Oh, by the way, if you make a mistake you're fired. Mm -hmm. Is Wait, that they that tell you training? They tell you. Let's you know. Let's discuss that. Is that poor training? I mean, you it, you can argue that both ways. Is that poor training, or is that just setting that expectation? To me, for excellent expectations. I don't know. It goes both ways. It's, it might be their expectation, but you can't put that much pressure on a new trainee. But at the same time, they tell you to not worry. You know. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. They can't put that. They tell you, you know, this is your training period. So. As you're learning the facility or the company, you're going to end up making a mistake. That's just being human because you don't know how their organization runs. So for you to make a mistake, as long as you're not burning down the building, I don't think you should be fired like typically like that. But it all depends on your job also. If you have a job where you're doing finances, you don't want to make a big mistake because then you might mess up somebody's money. And then that's going to be something that the company is going to have to go back and backtrack and find out where your mistake is. So I guess it's all in where you. you yeah, work. I think it depends on a lot. I think mm -hmm. it depends on what you're doing, what the task is, um, what the mistake is. But I do agree that to expect somebody new to not make any mistakes is a bit, you know, yeah. I feel like it's a little bit unrealistic. I think that. As a manager or as a supervisor, you have to expect that they're going to make some mistakes to a certain degree. Now, if it's months and months down the road and they're still making mistakes, that's totally different. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to go into the situation that when you just hire somebody, in your mind, you have to expect that they're going to make a couple mistakes, I think. Um, it is a fine line because you do want to make sure that you are promoting excellence and you want to make sure that you're encouraging them to be a high performer. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to run them away. Right. You just hire them. And you don't want them to you know, quit the next week because they're scared to make a mistake or mm -hmm. they make a mistake and they're on a the chopping block, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that depends. Now, if you're working in healthcare and you're working with a resident and you make a big uh, mistake, mm -hmm. that's kind of, eh, 
Because if you're already working in the healthcare field and you come into a new organization, the patient is not going to change. The, the way they are, the way you treat them is not going to change. So, I mean, if you come in and you can't do your job as far as that's concerned, dealing Let's stop with the right patient, there, though. That's going to fall back on who? The manager. Why? Because that's going to, you should have did your homework on their past jobs. Correct. So, while we have to expect them to make a few mistakes, at the same time, they shouldn't be making too many mistakes because we hired them. We, you know, we screened them, we recruited them, we brought them in, we talked to them, we interviewed them, we hired them. So if they're making a lot of mistakes or they're not doing their job, we're probably going to get blamed for it because we're the ones that hired them. Um, so it, 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 it's kind of a fine line, but if you have done a good job with all of those steps, with the recruitment, the interviewing, the training, the orientation, Hopefully they won't be making too many mistakes. Now, while you know you can do your best job at screening people, some things do go unnoticed. You're not going to catch everything, you know. How about signing um, down with someone uh, like the first week? After like the first week. I mean, during the first week of training, signing them with someone to work with. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good idea. You know, having somebody, and some some organizations will do it like that, where a part of their training is shadowing somebody that's or sitting doing. down next to them and working with them and. And that usually helps so they can get that hands-on experience. Um, they're also getting to know somebody. Um, I think it's a good idea to assign a new employee like a buddy or a mentor or somebody that they can reference to if they need help or they're unsure about doing something. That way they can ask somebody before they hit that button <laughs> or whatever to make sure they don't make a mistake. Um, a lot of the people who say to me say, what's the manager or the supervisor? What's the person who tells you the trainee, like the trainer or whatever, that's the person who tells us like, you know, be aware of this, you know, try to not make mistakes and blah, 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 because the company, but it wasn't a supervisor. Well, that's why when we were talking about interviewing, I was saying that I think it's a good idea to have more than just one person in that, inter in that you know, interview process. If you're going to have someone that's a supervisor, someone that's going to be managing them, and someone totally different that's going to be training them, all three of them probably need to be involved in the interview process. Um, that way everybody's on the same page and, and you won't have that where you have discrepancy between what the training person is saying versus what the supervisor is saying. So yeah, definitely. Um, but at the end of the day, what I was getting to is mistakes are gonna happen. Everybody understand that, right? We, are, we make mistakes, right? Every, yeah, we're human. Um, but again, the reason that we spent the entire day talking about this is because this process is so important. When you're hiring somebody new, you have to go through each step. You can't slight yourself on the recruitment part or the interviewing part. Like you have to go through each step with a fine-tuned comb to make sure that by the end, when you when you've gotten to the stage of training, you've done a good job. The person's here to stay. Hopefully, they're going to stay for years and years to come. Um, but if not. Even if they come and they only stay for a little while, you still got a good employee. The or, or a lot of organizations have cut their orientation they have. down to videos. Yeah. What is mm -hmm. a video going to teach me? Well, I can't ask a video a question. If I don't understand something, I can't ask a video. So I'm yeah. sitting here for four hours watching six videos. Mm -hmm. Well, it's and hard because dollars. They don't have the money. You know, and then it's like when you get on the floor, you're training, but they put you with somebody who's not really a good worker, you know, just mm -hmm. to train. You know, and then so you're learning bad habits as you're training. Mm -hmm. right. So it's kind of hard to, you have to make sure that your organization, your employees that are already on the floor are doing what they're supposed to before you stick somebody with them. Right. Because, I mean, you're not orient. a lot of people are, aren't orientating anymore. They're not walking you around. They're not talking to you. They're just putting you in front of a video. Watch this video for four hours. Then we're going to walk you around. Then, you know, you can go and come back on this day and you're going to start training. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, once you guys go out into the workforce, you will remember this discussion and you won't have this problem. And as far as um, you know, us talking about pairing somebody up with a buddy or a mentor, in my mind, if I'm the manager, I'm gonna pair them up with the highest performing person on my floor yeah. so that they are trained well and they do get that 
good foundation as to what's supposed to be done. So again, that falls back on the manager, whoever paired them with that I person. There's so many that, that do that favoritism, that yeah. favoritism thing. Like, oh, that's my buddy. Okay, you gonna go work with her. Yeah. You know, I know her. You gonna go work with her, but she might not be a good employee. She right. might just be there just because you're in management and you're not gonna fire her. You know what I'm saying? It's at the end of the day, a lot of stuff is gonna fall back to, to you, management. Mm -hmm. to management. If you make the decision to pair them with a poor performer and that employee turns into a poor performer, they're going to blame you. They're going to say, who trained this person? Or who decided to put this employee with, with that person? Um, so you have to always make sure that you're making good decisions um, and not you know, doing favoritism or anything like that, that you're making the best decision for your team and for your organization. It's good to ask them at the end of their training, too, if they understand. If there's nothing, anything that they don't understand before I stick you on the floor, is there anything you don't understand that I need to go back over? that was not taught to you. Right. Because a lot of people, they get to the end of their training and they only have half of what they need to know. That next week they start on their own and they're making boo boo mistakes. Well, I don't think that you will necessarily cover every single thing in training. There's gonna be some things that come up that weren't covered in training. It just happens that way. Yeah, um, but that's where the question comes in at the end before you put them by themselves, you know. Is no, there anything you don't I, I hear what you're saying, but think about a healthcare environment. And how it's fast paced. Fast paced and how different everything is every day. You know, you might not have in training anything about that patient that runs outside around the building because they're kind of off. That may not be in training, but it could happen. Right. You know what I mean? So everything that happens in your healthcare environment is not going to be covered in training. No. But as long as they have the basic foundations and things that they need to know to perform their job, then you just have to know that if other things do arise, that you'll be be there to help them take care of it. Any other questions about what we talked about today? We're out of time, so I'll see you guys on Thursday.